Pan 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 Psychast. Part two: Further analysis and discussion. In your first world-altering book, The Selfish Gene, you describe nature as red in tooth and claw, referring to the ruthless competitive state in which the world's creatures find themselves in. As we spoke about in our last installment, William Paley thought quite the opposite, and here's a quite an entertaining quote from his book Natural Theology. Paley writes, It is a happy world after all. The air, the earth, the water teem with delighted existence. In a spring noon or a summer evening, on whichever side I turn my eyes, Myriads of happy beings crowd upon my view. A bee amongst the flowers in spring is one of the cheerfulest objects that could be looked upon. Its life appears to be all enjoyment, so busy and so pleased. Happiness is the rule, misery the exception. Paley was around post-Darwin. What kind of things would you point Paley towards in the natural world to knock him off his optimistic pedestal? Interestingly, that phrase, nature read in tooth and claw, Tennyson wrote it before ah. the origin of species. It was about eight years before. Well. I mean, you can pick your arguments, you can pick your examples to illustrate the benevolence of nature and just the reverse. Darwin himself pointed to the Ignumonidae, the group of Mm. parasitic wasps which lay their eggs in other insects, caterpillars. The larvae then hatch out and eat the victim alive from Mm. within. And parasitic wasps do this. I'm not sure Darwin knew this, but they sting the victim in such a way that it's paralyzed but doesn't rot, so it's still alive, which means, as it were, keeping fresh for the larva to eat. Darwin held that up. He said, I can't believe that a benevolent deity would knowingly create the ichneumonidae. And of course, so many animals die Mm. suffering, either from parasites or from predators or from starvation. You can make whatever case you like by picking your examples, Mm. you cherry pick your examples. So I'm not impressed by either it's in a way it's unfortunate that my title, the selfish gene, is taken to mean that animals are selfish. Right. It doesn't mean that. It means that genes are selfish. Genes look after their own interests. Genes do whatever they can to survive through many generations. And if that means making individual animals selfish, so be it. Mm-hmm. But if it means making individual animals altruistic, so be it. And it does both. And the selfish gene, the book, The Selfish Gene, explains both altruistic behavior and selfish behavior. Mm of individuals in terms of selfish genes. So if I called the book The Selfish Elephant, it would have been a a (laughs) totally different message. But The Selfish Gene actually means something really rather precise, Hmm. which you don't get until you've read the book itself. You mentioned Darwin thought that this pain and suffering in the natural world was a reason to object to God's existence. You follow the same line there, would you think? No, I mean, I think there are more profound reasons for disbelieving in God. To many people, to many theologians actually find the problem of evil, as they Hmm. call it, the odyssey to be their biggest problem. I don't find that a problem at all. If I were a theologian, I would say, well, maybe God's just evil. Just because there's evil in the world doesn't prove anything. Mm. And what's interesting is the design in the world. Mm. And if you look at the way a predator, like a lion or a leopard or a cheetah, is designed to kill antelopes, and you look at the way Mm. antelopes are designed to run away from them, you have to ask whose side God is on. Both of them are designed to cause the others to suffer. Mm -hmm. Lions are designed to make antelopes suffer, Antelopes are designed to make lions suffer if they starve, if they succeed in running away. So natural selection, there is a sense in which it's read in tooth and claw. There is a sense Mm -hmm. in which natural selection leads to suffering. If it didn't, then there'd be something wrong. If an animal is too well fed and too happy and prosperous, Mm. then something's going wrong there. It'll be outcompeted by another animal that does things better, Mm -hmm. survives better with a bit of suffering. So there is a sense in which natural selection leads to suffering. Mm -hmm. And we who live in such cushy surroundings are shielded from that, thank goodness. And we have doctors and we have hospitals and antibiotics and things to save us from the ravages of parasites. We never have to fear a predator, Mm. very, very seldom. But a wild animal... And our wild ancestors, until quite recently, had to live in constant fear Mm. of predators, in constant fear of disease, in constant fear of parasites, in constant fear of starvation. Mm. Yeah, so for some people, and the great mathematician Blaise Pascal, not believing in God just isn't worth the risk, given that there's a very, very slight chance that God does exist, 
it's worth placing our faith in God as we might be rewarded with infinite pleasure in heaven. Whilst on the alternative of not believing in God, we have very little to gain besides missing church. Do you think that on the grounds of our personal interest, there might be a reason to favour theism over atheism? Or do you think that there is actually much to be gained by being an atheist? If God really cares about people believing in him, what an egocentric <laughs> megalomaniac he must be. I mean, why believe? Why not reward people for being good rather than for believing in him? What's so special about believing in him? Why would Pascal, I don't believe Pascal really believed that, but what, why would Pascal <laughs> think that believing in him was so much to be rewarded by God? In any case, which God? Hmm. Maybe it would turn out to be Baal or Thor or Wotan or Zeus, in which case maybe a jealous God, he always called himself jealous in the Old Testament, would punish you for believing in the wrong God. Mm. Pascal's wager is a, is a most stupid argument. You've mentioned, why wouldn't God reward you for being good? Something you're often cited by, I've seen this over and over again, reading philosophers of religion who are theists. They often cite your work as, well, here's Richard Dawkins saying, morality is only there to ensure the survival of our genes. It's just evolutionarily unfashionable to be bad. And so there's no real objective grounding to goodness and good acts or bad acts. Well, I don't really fall back on Darwinism for morality. And I, mm. think, I think that morality arises by intelligent design, if I can put it that way. Okay. We have moral philosophers, we have the golden rule, we have how would you like it if other people treated you like that? These are all sorts of arguments which arise only very indirectly out of Darwinism. Mm. They arise out of human culture. They arise out of long history of philosophical discussion, of jurisprudential argument, of parliamentary argument, journalism, just plain civilized discussion. We talk about morality. We talk about what's the right thing to do. We talk about the kind of society in which we like to live. Mm. And if you look at the history of morals, history of ethics, the moral standards of any particular time are very different from those of earlier centuries. Mm. And they seem to be, by our standards today, getting better. Right. So we no longer believe in slavery. We treat women better than we used to. We treat animals better than we used to. We treat children better than we used to. We no longer send little boys up chimneys. There are all sorts of ways in which the morality of the 21st century is different from the morality of 100 years ago, 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. Just read fiction of 100 years ago. What would that be? Is so Agatha Christie, for example, just thrillers, Bulldog Drummond, Edgar Wallace. You would find language which would no longer be acceptable, mm. sexist language, racist language, assumptions which would no longer be acceptable. 200 years ago, even worse. If you go back to, say, the time of Darwin, Darwin's exact contemporary, Abraham Lincoln, freed the slaves, but on the other hand, was in absolutely no doubt that black people were inferior to white mm. people. He said so explicitly. Although Lincoln was clearly in the vanguard of progressive opinion of his time, mm -hmm. so was T.H. Huxley. And T.H. Huxley was, by modern standards, a racist. Mm. Everybody was in those days. So things change. I called it the shifting moral zeitgeist. This has nothing to do with religion. It's nothing to do with holy books. Mm. It's something to do with something in the air, not a mystical statement. It's by something in the air, I mean what I was talking about before, things like moral philosophers discussing journalism. Mm -hmm. We can see it now. We can see that not just century to century, from decade to decade, mm. the standards are changing. It's nothing to do with religion. If we did base our morality on religion, we would be stoning people to death for adultery for breaking the Sabbath, all sorts of utterly ludicrous things. Mm. Nobody seriously thinks that we should take our morality from the Bible. You say when you read the Bible, you're picking the bits that you want to include, the things that you take, you're measuring it against something outside of the Bible. Exactly. It's interesting though there that the first time you stated it, you said that as time progresses, the morality of a society gets better. So we no longer think racism, sexism, things like this are appropriate in, in 21st century England. But to say they're better, do you not need to measure them against something other than the societies well, themselves? Well, yes, indeed. What we're doing is measuring them against 21st century morality. Right. And it's our decision as 21st century citizens that that's better. Now, it's possible that Henry VIII would disagree, but we are creatures of the 21st century. And whatever it is we think of as moral, we can pick and choose verses from the Bible. About the only really decent verses you can find are the Sermon on the Mount. And so we pick them and we say, look at that, look at that, that's, yeah. that's in the Bible. But then you look at the rest of the Bible and it's hideous from a moral point of view. 
Let us pause for a wee jiffy to say a quick thank you to the show's patrons for making this episode possible. In particular, a very special thank you to the man who'll never fit through the eye of a needle. It's Joe Richardson. Trapped in a constant state of purgatory, it's Mr. Jimmy Casperson. On the fifth day, God created small animals that Justin scurry along the ground. That's what happened. Walking on water, it's Mr. Chris Ford. She might steal children, but she doesn't indoctrinate them. It's Leslie Robson Foster. He hates evolution. The Earth is only 6,000 years old, says Carter Young. Elegant from bottom to top, it's Dan Posh. Perhaps there is an intelligent being who directs things towards the end. It's Zachary Arnold. Driving theists round the bend, it's Matt Carrera. There's nothing religious about his experience, it's Neural Surge. The man who loves sheep more than Jesus, it's Anthony Welsh. Embodying the problem of natural evil, it's Il Isa Yuse. Greeks believed in Zeus. Hindus believe in Vishnu. Vikings believed in Thor. I presume you don't believe in Zeus, Vishnu or Thor. So what makes your belief in Mr. Jim Clare any different? If you're enjoying the show and want to knock God off his throne, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash pansycast to show your support. Right, let's jump back into it. You said you like Thor's experiments at the start of the first installment. You might hate this one. Uh, physically, it's a little bit out there. But so you've got Henry VIII and, and yourself and you put you both in a void, both from the backgrounds from different points in history. And you were to debate as to whether or not it's okay to have a certain view about a particular race or gender or sex. If the morality is grounded in the time and the philosophies and the debate of the time, how could you say that you were right and Henry okay, VIII was and that's wrong? very difficult. And I don't know how I would try to persuade yeah. Henry VIII or Genghis Khan. Or, I don't think or, he would or, be persuaded or, 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 by yeah. any reason. <laughs> but the one thing I would say is that the Bible is not something that I would appeal to. And I don't think that anybody today seriously thinks their morality is based on the Bible. Americans love to talk about the Ten Commandments. They don't Mm. know what the Ten Commandments are. They love to put up the Ten Commandments in Mm. courthouses and things. The only way you can justify basing your morality on the Bible is by cherry picking. And you can pick the Sermon on the Mount. I I almost defy you to find anything else in the Bible, actually, that by modern standards is moral. Someone, a lawyer, say to Jesus, like, hey, can you sum it all up for me? I wasn't listening. And he says, just love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's well, all that, you that's need to that's similar. Do. Okay, I mean, Jesus said some pretty nice things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you said in the past that you preferred if the number of religious believers fell to zero. What would you say to those who claim that they're better off being religious so that their well-being is improved through their community, the love of a cosmic father, and the belief that the departed relatives are in a better place? Yes, I mean, that could be so. What you're kind of saying is people get comfort and they're happier if Mm. they believe a falsehood. And I can imagine that you get comfort from being a falsehood. I could imagine that believing lies makes some people happy. And I suppose an analogy would be somebody who doesn't want a doctor to tell them the truth about what they've got. Mm. There are such people. I expect you would prefer the doctor to tell you the truth. And I would. But it's not a powerful argument. It's an argument. And if you're persuaded by it, good luck to you. Do you think that atheists can take the best of both worlds, so reject the supernatural element of religious, but engage in spiritual traditions such as meditation and mindfulness? Yes, well, meditation doesn't have to be religious. Mm. You can see meditation, I think my colleague Sam Harris would say it's a physiological exercise that has beneficial effects. Mm. You could make the point perhaps more powerful if you say we can be atheists but we enjoy the sacred music of Bach Mm. and Mozart and of course we do and the beautiful cathedrals and I mean I whenever I go I love to go look at cathedrals and magnificent buildings and they're deeply moving Mm. but that's not incompatible Mm. with being an atheist it's rather like well I find Mozart's Requiem very moving I find uh, Bach's uh, St. Matthew Passion very moving Uh, Handel's Messiah, very moving. These are moving, even though I don't believe the stories behind them. In the Mm. same way, I find fiction moving. I mean, you can empathize with characters in fiction when knowing perfectly well they never existed. Mm -hmm. But you sympathize with the characters. You can, you love the characters almost. You can care what happens to them. Mm. And I think that's the approach to take when you ask an atheist how they can enjoy something like St. Matthew Passion. Is am right in thinking you've described yourself, you embrace the community of Christianity, but just not the, well, the metaphysical beliefs? Yes, I suppose. I mean, in, in the sense of enjoying the music and the, yeah. and the cathedrals and things. Obviously, as a child, I presume you 
went to church because you yes. said to would, if you would you still visit I, I don't find a, ordinary church services, services very moving I, no. I mean I think they're rather boring actually <laughs> uh, but great music yeah well, it links to one of our listener questions and Linwood wrote in and said the following they ask as a man of science it seems that you've made it your task to discourage and debunk religious belief whenever you may encounter it and this person finishes their question by asking you but Richard is it ethical to try and dissuade someone from their faith, even if it has no negative consequences. Essentially saying, are you not doing something immoral by trying to change someone's mind, even if they're not harming somebody? Can't we just leave those people to... I put my books out there and people can read them if they want to. I don't go doorstepping like a Jehovah's <laughs> Witness. And I'm a lover of truth, and that means scientific truth. Mm. So I like to write books about science. Mm -hmm. And I regard... The God delusion, in a way, as a scientific book, because I think mm. that theism is a scientific hypothesis. I think it's an erroneous one, but it is a scientific hypothesis. And so I'm interested in it as a scientific hypothesis. Mm. And so I like to write about it in the same way, in the same spirit as I write a science book. And as I say, people can read it or not. They can take it if they like and leave it alone if they like. It's interesting you describe the question of God as a, a scientific hypothesis. I kind of think that post-Galileo, we're just looking at physical causes and effects. We're just looking at previous states and seeing what their effects are in the future and doing the hard work and predicting what's going to happen again in the future. Sorry, that was a dreadful rendition of what physical science does. But the point being yeah, is, that, is that God not outside? exactly not scientific of... in that sense, but it is scientific in the sense that to believe in a prime mover, a creative intelligence at the base of the universe, that is a scientific hypothesis because mm -hmm. the universe that's created by an intelligence is an entirely different kind of universe from mm. one that's not. Okay. If it could be demonstrated that there was a creative intelligence at the base of the universe, it would be a profoundly revolutionary scientific mm. idea. I wonder if there's an aspect of, say, pure philosophy here rather than it just being majority scientific. We had Daisy Dixon on the show, our last guest, who said that she thought there was a beauty to the ontological argument. And we mentioned Eugene Nagasawa, who's converted as an atheist to a theist on that grounds as well. Here we've got a purely logical argument, the existence of God. They say, there you go, I can prove it in an instant. I suppose you need a philosophical approach to debunk that argument, right? You can't appeal to physical science for that one. I've never found the ontological argument anything but ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> it's just, I can't understand why anybody takes it seriously. Mm. The, the very Russell? idea that by pure words, mm. you can conclude something about the universe. Is it not the equivalent to like, you know, there are no square circles, right? I say something there, which is pure words. I say something about the universe. That seems like... A philosophical point, right? And then that's perhaps where you get off the bus, right? In the same way you can prove God's existence. Are you happy with those other statements, those clearly true logical ones? Just what's different about it? Well, it's been debunked many times by philosophers. It, to me as a scientist, the point remains that the very idea that by sitting in an armchair mm. and logic chopping with mere words, you can conclude something about something as grand and important as the universe is just demeaning. Mm. Final question, I'll push you on this. Do you see this as equally as, as embarrassing or as unreasonable, let's say, as the religious fundamentalist point? Do you think you've got the religious fundamentalist that you can't change my mind no matter what, I believe in God, nothing you can say can shake my faith. And then you've got someone who's introduced by one of these logic chopping arguments and from their armchair, they're converted from your position to one well, I think the, the fundamentalist it's even worse in a way because mm. that, that's just taking a book which there's no reason to take that book any more seriously than there are creation myths from all over the world and mm -hmm. they all, they're all different from each other and it's just a mere accident that the religious fundamentalist happens to be brought up in a Judeo-Christian environment and therefore mm knows the book of Genesis rather than a theory of some African tribe mm -hmm. which they possibly believe just as strongly. Thank you to everybody who submitted a listener question for Richard. As you can expect, we had absolutely loads. You might hold the record for the most listener questions, Richard. We've already asked one during our discussion there, and we've just got uh, two or three more that we're going to have a quick fire round with here. The first one, Rose. So the first one is from Lucy Madden from the UK, and she asks, which of the traditional arguments for the existence of God do you find the least convincing and why? The least convincing... I suppose arguments from scripture, where it's just arbitrary, which particular kind of scripture you happen to have been brought up in. But it's a pretty tough job thinking of the least convincing. <laughs> they're all unconvincing. So, Is there any you find more convincing? Is there one 
which you say, oh, I can see well, why you do the, that. I suppose but, the fine-tuning argument we talked about earlier, okay. I don't think it's convincing, but since I don't know enough physics to really demolish it in the way that a physicist could, I suppose mm-hmm. that, that would be one reason. A second question comes from Lucy Olenshaw from the UK, who asks, if you were stuck on a desert island with a philosopher, who would you like to be stuck with and why? I'm going to push you on a philosopher as well. You're not allowed to pick someone who you'd be typically thought of as a scientist. And you'd have to live with this person too. Um, but Russell. That's a very good pick. Our final and maybe most important question <laughs> comes from Chris Irwin from New Zealand, which is, Richard Dawkins has loads of amazing ties. Could you please ask him where he gets them from? Painted, they're hand, they're hand painted. Oh, wow. By Lala Ward, who is then my wife. Yes. And some of the more recent ones are painted by an Italian young man called Leonardo. Wow. Amazing. How many do you have, if you, if you don't mind asking? You've every, I can't remember. About, you about, must have an extraordinary amount. About 15. They're beautiful. And we're with you on that, Chris. A round of concluding remarks just to wrap us up then, Rose. Would you like to kick us off? Yeah, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you and to go through all these arguments and understand more about the atheistic worldview. And just through researching this episode, I find that it's really pushed me and must push people in general to really examine their beliefs and questions what they believe and why. And I think that's just really interesting to get into your work. And another thing that's been a pleasure reading your work is learning more about natural selection and evolution. And it really changes the way you see the world around you when you see that everything is the result of such an interesting story, is the result of thousands of years of coming to that point. Yeah, so I feel like uh, you just really see the world for how extraordinary it is. And I think when I read all of that, it makes me really excited to learn more about science and for all the scientific discoveries which are still to be made. So I just yeah, feel really excited from reading your work. Well, thank you. That's very nice to hear. What do you believe yourself? What do I believe myself? Um, So... I was brought up a Catholic, but I read a lot of your work for my A-level, actually. And to be honest, after that, I didn't really think about it all that much. So it's been really interesting to reread your work and actually you have to get into those questions again. You haven't answered my question, have you? (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, Well, I believe in God, but I think I, from reading your work, I'm definitely going to have a good think of what exactly I do believe. Okay. Yes. I was very brave to tell Richard Dawkins, she's like, you do believe in God after that, that long discussion. I admire for that. Yeah, I'd like to echo, apart from the last bit about believing in God, echo all of Rose's <laughs> comments there. Um, it's been a pleasure to get to speak to you, Richard, and finally get to read lots of your books. I think I mentioned off microphone, reading uh, some of your early work. Perhaps I was too young to appreciate it, but I knew about how influential and revolutionary your work is in terms of evolutionary biology. I knew a about your views regarding philosophy of religion, having done a fair bit of philosophy of religion in my time. And it was great to, to pick up those arguments again. And if I'm honest, you mentioned fine-tuning a moment ago. A lot of people kind of make fun of the argument which says, well, who designed God, right? And people say, well, that's a bit of a silly question to ask because by definition, God doesn't need designing. But I think what was really interesting is the way you phrase that in terms of, well, God would have to be complex if he's going yeah. to turn the dials in that way. Yes. And seeing your discussion with Rowan Williams and you'd make that point there, and he kind of, he has to scratch his head for a while and he comes up with some arguments to say, well, it's not the kind of thing you find in nature, so it wouldn't have to be complex. And I read some of the responses from other philosophers of religion and weren't too impressed. So I think there's a lot more subtlety or there's nuance to your arguments that I think a lot of philosophers of religion overlook. But I think that comes through in the amount of things we've read for this project in particular, which are incredibly dense and difficult and dry. And apologies to any previous guests who might be listening. I'm sure you're not on that list. But the way you write is, I was saying to you a moment ago, something I'm in awe of, just the flow between your sentences, the selection of your words, the rhythm of it. And I myself, perhaps like Rose, wasn't in the world of science or particularly interested in ideas of evolution. The text one would pick up in academic journals and so on would just be way over my head. But you managed to convey the ideas without losing the rigorousness of them Mm -hmm. so eloquently. And I think I've caught myself laughing out loud quite a few times as well. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There's a moment in Outgrowing God, I think you mentioned there's a story of you say, oh, Mohammed could have said all of this stuff about the world. But instead he said, no, the sun just goes down into the woods. I remember laughing out quite a lot. Listeners wouldn't forgive us for letting you be the only guest of all to... No, it's one of these awful standard questions that you ask everybody, is it? Who would you like to have dinner with or who would you like to sleep with? Or... <laughs> <laughs> pop, 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 pop.
philosophy quiz. So you're going to have quotes from three different people and you've got to tell me who the quote is from. So we're playing Richard Dawkins, Richard Dawkins. So you've got quotes from a Richard, the founder of Virgin Group multi-billionaire spaceman Richard Branson. You've got quotes from a Jack Dawkins, also known as the Artful Dodger from Charles Dickens's Oliver Twist. And you've got quotes from Richard Dawkins, the evolutionary biologist and author. And all the quotes are taken from your 29 bestseller, Outgrowing God, or else it would be way too difficult for us to be able to guess them. So you fastest finger, I want you to, it's Rose v. Richard, simply say Richard Dawkins or Richard Dawkins. Okay? It's either the, the Dodger, Branson or me. Yes. Complexity is your enemy. Any fool can make something complicated. It's hard to make something simple. Richard Dawkins? It's not Richard Dawkins. No, it's <laughs> definitely not. Um, I think it might be Richard Branson. Richard Branson, 102 Richard. We all have dreams and many of them are pretty weird. Mine almost always are, but I don't write them down. And I certainly don't think they're interesting enough to inflict upon other people. Richard Dawkins. Artful Dodger. No, it's not Artful Dodger. What, what's <laughs> the answer? A, it's Richard Dawkins. Oh, really? That's from Outgrowing God. <laughs> a friend's just an enemy in disguise. You can't trust anybody. That'll be the Artful Dodger. Artful Dodger. Two on to Richard. The best lesson I learned was to just do it. It doesn't matter what it is or how hard it might seem. As the ancient Greek Plato said, the beginning is the most important part of any work. Richard Branson. Richard Branson, 312. Richard, are you? I was going to say the same, but I was late. I'm sure you were after yeah. I said yes. <laughs> arguing over whether angels or demigods is rather like arguing whether fairies are the same as pixies. Richard Dawkins. Yes. Dawkins, three, two. Once the villain, you're a villain to the end. We artful dodger. For one. Luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Richard Branson. Branson. Making fun? Yes. Savage? Maybe. Unfair? I truly don't think so. Me. And finally, consider yourself well in. Consider yourself part of the furniture. There isn't a lot to spare. Who cares? Whatever we've got to share. Well, that's from Oliver, but I don't think it's the Artful Dodger. You don't think so? <laughs> well, I hope... <laughs> Well, I hope it is. Maybe it? It is. Someone can check and write in. If you've enjoyed this episode and want to learn more about Professor Dawkins and his work, then the best place to go is richarddawkins.com, where you can find a list to all 20 of his books, including Outgrowing God, The God Delusion, The Selfish Gene, The Blind Watchmaker, and his latest bestseller, Flights of Fancy, as well as links to articles, videos, events, and other links of interest, including the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science. Thank you. You've been listening to the wonderful, soothing voices of Miss Rose de Castellan. Thank you for listening. Professor Richard Dawkins. Thank you very much. And me, Jack Symes. Thank you for listening.